Hello, my name is Dr. James Young. I'm a port identifier in the Port of Baltimore with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I'm also a gilicoid specialist for PPQ. Today I'll be talking about adult gilicoids, uh, which are rarely intercepted in cargo or baggage. However, they are very important to American agriculture, and we have several survey programs that are trapping these pests. I will be giving the first half of this presentation. The second half will be given by the co-author, James Hayden, and he will introduce himself at the switch. So to identify Gilakiidae, you have to be able to first identify the superfamily. Uh, and to do this, there's three fairly easy characters to see. Um, however, actually getting the specimens in the correct position to see these characters can be tricky. So I'll give you a few hints on how to position the specimens correctly. So the first is the base of the proboscis covered in scales. With AQI work, we often get specimens that are broken and damaged, so this character can be tricky at times. As you can see from the image here, you have to position the body with the head up. Uh, when possible, please put the specimen on a minuton, and you can manipulate it easier that way without damaging the specimen further. The maxillary palpi also clasp the base of the proboscis. Uh, this is a very small structure. It is indicated by the small purple arrow here in the bottom of the photograph. And again, getting the lighting correct and the position of the head is the only way you'll be able to see these structures. The last structure is the labial palpi. They are strongly recurved. Now because they are so obvious and protruding from the head, they break off easily. When we're talking with specimens from traps, a lot of times they break off and they're still stuck in the gum itself, so you may be able to recover them. To identify Gilakiidae from the other members of Gilakoidea, these characters will work most of the time, not all of the time. First off, CUP is absent from the forewing, so you can see it present down here between CUA2 and 1A and 2A, and up here that vein is missing. M4 and CUA1 in the hind wing are typically combined, shown here as a combined. Down here they are still separate. CUP in the hind wing is absent. This is going to eliminate the elasticity. And lastly, the maxillary palpi with four segments. These can be hard to actually count, uh, largely due to the presence of scales covering the structure. You can either try to remove the scales or use some lighting tricks uh, where you focus the light from below and try to shine through and find the divisions in the structure itself. So how are these specimens found in trapping and surveys? And it's largely used by black lights, which have a lot of positives and negatives. The strongest positive is you end up with fairly good looking specimens, but only if you use a kill strip. For surveys where traps are running for more than four or five days without being attended, if you don't put a kill strip inside, the specimens will essentially beat themselves to death and you won't have anything worth really looking at. The negative is you get a lot of bycatch. On a warm, moist summer night, you can get two to three hundred specimens in one of these bucket style traps. Uh, it's a lot of sorting to go through to get the specimens that are of target. Uh, one of the alternative methods is a baited bucket trap. These are dry traps. Uh, they work very well if the weather is dry and they have limited bycatch because the trap itself is not attracting the pest it is the chemical that is coming out of it. So you don't get a lot of other species drifting in. One of the negatives is rain and high moisture equal mold in these situations. Baited sticky traps, they're not impacted as much by moisture and bait reduces the bycatch in them. However, you end up with specimens that are rather nasty to look at. Here's an example of one trap that was being run in Maryland. As you can see, there are several large moths present and there are some micros here that are potential targets. As you can see, most of the wing pattern has been lost from these specimens. And this one is almost fully encased in the sticky goo. Uh, these ended up being a Yopana muted, and this was a Gilakoid. So the abdomen was removed, and then identification could begin. With surveys, we have a very limited trapping list. Uh, increasingly, we are worried about these species right around the ports of entry. So I'll be going through these four species quickly and try to give you some tips for identifying them. Because we're only looking at four pests, we can increase the number of things we look for to help filter out things that are non-targets. 
First off, the size. From the head to the tip of the wing, it should be less than five millimeters. The forewing should have a fringe near the tip, and the hindwing should also have a fringe. The hindwing should also come to a point. So for these specimens on sticky traps, a lot of times the gum or goo that is holding the pest on will actually clear some of these scales off, and you'll be able to see these structures fairly easily. It'll also hold this fringe on uh, so it won't be lost. First off, looking at Tuta absoluta. In North America, the potential hosts are members of the genera Solanum, uh, Lycoperson, and Nicotina. So these are your peppers, your tomatoes, and tobacco. The adults are fairly nondescript. They are a silvery gray to brown in coloration, and they're rather small. Tessia, uh, Solanivora, is another species of concern. It is a pest only on potato, and it actually feeds in the tuber itself, and some literature reports it feeding in the lower portions of the stem. So this isn't something you're going to find on leaves as a larva, but the adult should come into traps. Pectophora gossiapella is the pink bollworm. It has many North American hosts, and it is established in some areas of North America. Uh, it is one that is currently under eradication. Uh, sterile male projects are being used to help reduce numbers in combination with uh, pesticide treatments and uh, IPM programs. A close relative, Pycnophora uh, scutigera, is not known from North America. Uh, it has two potential North American hosts, uh, the genera Gossiapium and Hibiscus. So we have added into the mix now a widely planted uh, ornamental plant. The identification of these species almost always requires either DNA or dissection or a combination thereof. Uh, here looking at the male genitalia, you can see that Tessia and Tuta absoluta have genitalia that are close in their general layout and scheme. Uh, they have long valves and they have a modified structure that actually covers these. Um, when you do the first dissections of these, the genitalia are actually more like a cone and you have to cut them on one side to get them to look like this. So essentially the genitalia have been cut here and unfolded. So this isn't what you're going to see when you do your dissections. With Pycnophora, the genitalia are very similar and it's important to note that the spines and hairs here on the valve are diagnostically relevant and they should not be overcleaned because otherwise identifications become very hard uh, and we would have to rely entirely on DNA. The females, again, Tessia and Tuta, have similar uh, layouts. They have a large bursa with a single spine. Where Pycnophora, they both have double spines. And with Pycnophora, the curvature of this spine here is actually relevant for identification purposes. Uh, here are some references that will be very useful uh, if you're going to be doing identifications or working on this group.